yourself to the stream. Yeah. Um, I don't think you guys were live. No, we were not. They yeah, you're me. live now. All right. They told me to so, hold off. Here, we're going to go through our whole spiel. Sorry for the, the, uh, the delay, everybody. What is it? Three after seven. Normally, we would start right at seven. I think this is the first time we've ever been late. Eight. And it was we we're late for a good reason. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, thank you for joining Museum Ship Mafia, where we take you behind the scenes of the museum ships across the country oh. and around the world. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X and the uh, website, www.historyxchannel.com. Thank you for watching. So tonight, it's another live crossover broadcast. We've got three YouTube channels like normal, uh, the USS Slater, the Buffalo Naval Park, and of course, my YouTube channel, History X. So tonight, and let me get this pulled up while I'm uh, kind of scrambling here. Um, so tonight, we're going to be talking about and I've been kind of advertising it uh, for the last week or so. We're going to be talking about damage control. And I've always been kind of fascinated with this subject, but I never really could figure out a good way to talk about it until I came across a book that we're going to be talking about tonight called Trial by Fire by a guy by the name of P.T. Duterman. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about. So I'm glad to have him join us tonight. And of course, helping me as always uh the guys that you saw on the screen a few moments ago talking about uh shane stevenson from the buffalo naval park we've got john epp from the uss slater and of course connor kilgore handling the comments and questions like i say the levers and dials behind the scenes he's with the alexander henry coast guard museum ship coast guard icebreaker museum ship in thunder bay ontario so how was that for scrambling guys <laughs> that was great yeah good job yeah so all right so the reason we were late is because like i said we're we're, we're going to be covering um uh damage control and i'm going to pull this screen back up here but not just uh talking about damage control on various ships we're going to actually be talking about the uss franklin the carrier uss franklin which has a hell of a story and there's a really good way, in my opinion, of learning about this story by reading the historical fiction novel by a guy by the name of P.T. Duderman called Trial by Fire. And he goes really in depth into the whole scenario behind the bombing of the USS Franklin. So uh, I don't know. What do you guys do? You guys want to do a quick uh, review right or? You want to just bring them on? I said, let's yeah. go for it. All right, we're yeah, bringing them on. Okay. So we've got P.T. Duterman here. Can uh, Pete, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Fantastic. All right. This might work after all. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, I, I've read a ton of your books. I'm thrilled to have you on tonight. And I appreciate you doing all the emailing back and forth to join us. Um, we're thrilled to have you. Um, so how can, can you hear us all right? Yes. Oh, fantastic. All right. Well, then uh, let's just dive right into it, if you don't mind. So like I said, we're going to be talking about the USS Franklin, the carrier USS Franklin, which was commissioned, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in 1943 and is an Essex-class carrier that uh, went to sea and went to battle in the Pacific. Now, it was originally hit by a kamikaze attack, but that's not what we're gonna be talking about tonight because it actually made it back for repairs and then went back to sea uh, fully fit, mm. and then it was bombed. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So- yeah, Ken, Ken, if I'm not mistaken, she was hit three times in October of 44. Correct. And then Wright went back to Puget Sound and then the big one in March of 45 that the book covers. Yes. Right? So yeah. that so, welcome, Captain. Thank you for yeah, being here. PT, thanks for joining us. And uh let me get into li a little bit of PT's background because I think he's pretty fascinating. First of all, he attended the Naval Academy and he was commissioned as an officer and first served aboard the USS Morton, which is a destroyer, uh, DD-948. 
but he also served aboard swift boats uh, during Vietnam, as well as the USS Hull. So he's got some, some pretty deep experience to lean on. And he moved his way up through guided missile cruisers. He served aboard the USS, is it the Jouet? Is that how you pronounce it's it? Jouet. Jouet? Jouet, yep. All right. In the Pacific Fleet, he attended the Naval War College. He worked at the Pentagon. Uh, he was assigned to the Pentagon for several years, uh, became executive officer aboard the guided missile cruiser USS CF Adams. And then he assumed command of the guided missile destroyer Tatnall, DDG-19. Right. Um, but of course, he didn't stop there. He was appointed, appointed as a technical delegate delegate to the United Nations. He participated in arms negotiations with the Soviets in Geneva before he ever uh, published his first book. So this guy's got some history. I don't know. That's a resume. Do you, do you think he's resume. qualified to talk to us tonight? Um, he might just be. So, so uh, your first book was written in 1992. But Trial by Fire, that was just published, what? That was two years ago, correct? Correct, yeah. So what made you want to write a book about the bombing of the USS Franklin? Because I came into possession of the USS Franklin's running lights. Yeah, It's an interesting story. My father was the commander of the Eastern Sea Frontier and therefore also commander of the Atlantic Reserve Fleet. She'd been put in mothballs after the war. There was a chief petty officer on the Franklin who was in charge of keeping her safe as a part of the mothball fleet. He called my father, whom he knew, and said, I have been told the Franklin's going to the scrapyard. Would you like a memento from the ship? And my dad said, sure. So this chief sent my father the running lights, the physical red and green running lights from the Franklin. He turned them over to me and for several years I had them, which is when I went and learned about what happened to the Franklin and what a horror show it was. These running lights, had obviously been repaired and, and there were weld beads on them. But I plugged them into a 110 volt circuit at my farm in Georgia and they came on. <laughs> the running lights had three separate filaments. Now they were meant to be run by 220. So they were dim, but they actually still worked. This is 1965, 66. I kept them for a while and then the Naval Supply School up in Athens, Georgia had a World War II museum. So I said, hey guys, would you like to have these? And by the way, they work. Yes was the answer. So I took them up to Athens. They plugged them in and had them on display in this museum in Athens, Georgia with the lights on. Now, when the supply school moved to Pensacola, Florida, they no longer had room for a museum. So they handed them over to the Navy History Museum, which was so chock-a-block with memorabilia, things, items, they couldn't begin to display everything they had. So they sent them to a warehouse in Suitland, Maryland, where they are now. And about two years ago, I called up the warehouse, the history director at the warehouse and said, I'd like to get them back. He said, sure. <laughs> Sure. All you got to do is come up here. Great. And find them. Right. <laughs> and I said, find them? Yeah. He said, we got 150,000 items here. and They're not cataloged. So get a bottle of water. And we'll let you walk through the warehouse. If you see them, call me and I'll get them out of the warehouse and hand them back to you. So that was my association with the Franklin. Uh, well, wait, wait. Did you ever find them? I never went up there because I called again and I talked to a secretary. I said, how hard is this? And she said, how much time you got? <laughs> I said, well, it would probably take you a month. 
oh, to yes. get through all the stuff that they have warehouse here in Suitland, Maryland, to find these things. And you you might stumble on them immediately, but you might never find them. And I said, okay, one fine day. So <laughs> You just decided to write then you, without finding the running lights, but you already had a fascination with the Franklin. So you just Correct. decided to write the book anyway. Yeah. How long did it take you to do the research for this book? Well, in my business, um, I try to get a book out every year. So I spend three months or so doing the research. And at a certain point, because the research is always fascinating, I have to say, okay, cut it off. And as they say in the literary business, put ass to chair and start writing the book. And I mean, that's literally how it goes. I've got one coming out on Iwo Jima uh, this November. I knew all about Iwo Jima. Everybody knows all about Iwo Jima until I started doing the research. And then I realized I don't know anything about what actually happened there. But at a certain point, you got to stop and say, okay, get going, write the book. It takes me about six months to write it. And then the production process takes about six months and then bring it out uh, the next year. Now, one of the things that I found most interesting about the book is the way it starts out, which is uh, the Franklin's put back to sea after being hit by kamikazes, right? So a lot of damage had to be repaired. And you start the book off by... I believe a couple of, you know, sending a couple of ensigns basically on a wild goose chase with some architectural drawings of the ship, trying to find out are the uh, water mains, I think it was the firefighting water mains, are they the way the plans worked out? Basically, are the plans accurate? Right. And, and so you, you start off in a pretty technical approach to, you know, did that actually make you nervous to start a book off that way? I mean, a lot of people no. find that boring. I found it fascinating. No, and, and that's when I had command of the Tatnall, which was a guided missile destroyer, we were off coast of Lebanon and we had a very bad fire. And it was a fire in the missile fire control system, part of the superstructure. Didn't look like that, no. but it was a very... <laughs> Very bad fire. And one of our problems was we did not have the drawings that should have followed a major systems overgrade uh, upgrade because it takes the shipyard about two years to actually get the drawings done. Mm. So what they were doing on the Franklin was saying, all right, we've been repaired. They put some new firefighting systems in on the uh, hangar deck and are these drawings that we have still correct? And they were not, of course. They just, they, they were nothing like it. And so they wanted to find out, uh, well, uh, how right is it or how wrong is it? And that's what they were doing. When the, when the book starts, they realized that the drawings that they'd had before the kamikaze attacks were no longer correct. And that was based on research that you had done on the Franklin? Yeah. And from personal experience, when you do a major complex overhaul on a ship and change everything in, say, the missile fire control system, you're not going to get drawings for a couple of years. And it didn't seem to matter, except <laughs> when the fire broke out in those same systems, we had no idea how to get, for instance, the electrical power shut off to where the fire was. Because by design, missile fire control systems being a critical combat system, if you lose power in those spaces, there are several ways by which power is automatically restored. So if you're trying to turn the electricity off while you fight a fire that has set your aluminum superstructure on fire, the metal was burning. You can't do it without knowing where all this power is coming from. And that was what I faced. And I figured that's exactly what they faced on the Franklin. They had no correct plans. And so let's get into the attack on the Franklin. Um, I've got a ton of photos 
from the incident, which actually occurred, I believe, night March 19th of 1945. So it's towards the end of World War II. The the Japanese are on their heels, but the fight isn't out of them by any way, shape, or form. And and so a, uh, a Japanese dive bomber gets through the uh, the screening ships and drops a couple of 550 pound bombs, which land right on the deck and immediately start an intense fire because oh um, did i did i miss something sorry. oh okay oh that was connor making the noise so it starts sorry. an intense fire because the deck was full of corsairs getting ready to take off with uh, armed with missiles and uh full fuel tanks so this intense blaze starts and creates this list on the franklin the list the list <laughs> The list was created by firefighting water, believe it or not. What happened was this plane was called a Judy. He had two bombs on board. One was a semi-armor-piercing bomb. One was a conventional 500-pound bomb, both of which penetrated the flight deck. And what began the, the catastrophe was down on the flight deck, since they were in the middle of a launch, it did not have enough room up on the deck for all the planes that were going to go on the launch. They had stashed some planes down on the hangar deck, fully fueled and fully armed. Now, by doctrine, that was never done for this precise reason. You never armed and you never fueled the planes until you brought them up to the flight deck. You did not want, you know, high octane gasoline and a lot of ordnance down in the hangar deck, but that's what they had. And these two bombs went down and set all of that off in one catastrophic explosion. It was so big, there was a deck that was between the flight deck and the hangar deck, and it was called the gallery deck. And it was a deck that had ready rooms and uh, combat information centers. It didn't go the whole length of the ship. The explosion was so vast that it took that gallery deck and compressed it up against the flight deck, basically squishing everybody who was on the gallery deck. And the instant death, it was that big a bang. Then the stuff up on the flight deck started to let go. These were planes loaded with uh, rockets, bombs, and most of all, high octane aviation gasoline. And from then on, it was, it was just a catastrophe. Everything was burning, everything was exploding. The hangar deck, the deck that you walk on, on the hangar deck was armored. None of this got through the armored deck to the decks below. So, so she was not ever experiencing any flooding. And in damage control, there's a basic rule. You always address flooding before you address fire. Why? Because there's an infinite source of flooding water all around you, all the ocean. So it doesn't matter if you get the fires put out if the damn ship sinks. So, but, but that's not what happened to Franklin. Franklin, the hangar deck blew up. Absolutely just blew up and deformed the hangar deck. Um, Killed hundreds of people who were down there. Killed everybody on the gallery deck. And these were flight crews ready to go up to the flight deck and man their planes. They were just sitting there in their ready rooms. And the deck that they were sitting on went up to the overhead and, and flattened them. Killed them all. Everybody. And that, yeah, I've got a picture on my screen now. I don't know if you can see it, of her listing was after several hours of fighting the fires, the water from the firefighting efforts went down into the hangar deck and streamed down into the ship, into the main machinery spaces, into living spaces, <coughs> list on the ship. She was never in danger of sinking from the bombing. Mm -hmm. There was so much water. And remember, there were a cruiser alongside, destroyers alongside, all pumping water onto this fire. And the water had to go somewhere, didn't go off the ship, went in the ship. That's why yeah. you see the list. Yeah, and uh, 
there was actually there was a picture where the heck was that um showing uh, i think it was the next one um i think it was the santa fe yeah that was next to there it yeah, is yeah i didn't know if that was yeah. i didn't know if that was the santa fe or the pittsburgh well, well pittsburgh took her under tow correct. santa fe came alongside it was so bad she had to back out and then the skipper of the Santa Fe said, to hell with this. And he came back in and he collided yeah. with the starboard side of the Franklin, which locked the two ships together, damaging Santa Fe. But by doing that, guys could jump off the sponsons and the flight deck to get away from the fire and jump onto the Santa Fe. And the Santa Fe's firefighting systems could actually play on the fires on the Franklin. This picture here was the first effort of her coming alongside trying to help with the fires. Didn't work. So she backed out and then came back in and brought it right alongside grinding steel, hull to hull, antenna snapping off, lifeline snapping off, and held his ship alongside Franklin so the people could jump out of the burning fires. Pittsburgh was a heavy cruiser, and she came up front of the Franklin and took her under tow. They were only 85 miles or so from Japan. So Pittsburgh took her under tow and, and tried to get her the hell away from Japan. Yeah, here are, a here are a couple of pictures of the Santa Fe, like you said, just rammed right up next to the Franklin, the... Um, the lower edge, you know, there was like a, I think it was like a 12 degree pitch to the deck. And so here's the Santa Fe trying, you know, and, and here's the other aspect of the story, which I'll get to in a second, but yeah, here's another picture of the Santa Fe with a uh, line going across. You can see them trying to get patients from the carrier to uh, the cruiser so the pictures are are fascinating, but what I what I want to go to, you know, that is a key part of the story. The reason why the Santa Fe was there. Let me see if I can find this. Um, are these pictures right here? All of the, or I shouldn't say all of the, but uh, uh, quite a few of the crew that were on the flight deck had to go to the bow because what you see in this picture that wall of white behind them is actually the blaze you know that was kind of behind the island correct yeah and the other part of it was a lot of these airplanes were armed with these 11.75 inch rockets and these rockets would get heated up and would launch from the wings of the airplane and fly straight up the flight deck at about three foot off the flight deck and guys who got in the way of one of those were cut in half. Then there were all the uh, 20 millimeter and 50 caliber guns on these airplanes. That started going off. Pointed, of course, straight up ahead. They had, they just, they couldn't stay there. They just mm -hmm. couldn't stay there. They were getting killed. Um, this is one of the big issues on the, on the Franklin that uh, almost a thousand men of the crew left the ship, jumped in the water, were picked up by Santa Fe, picked up by destroyers. And when it came down to the final damage control efforts, there were only about 500 out of 3,000 effectives aboard the carrier to fight the fires and to try to reconstitute the ship. They'd, they'd been blown off, they'd left. Now, before I invited you to join us, uh, here tonight, I gave the guys the reading assignment of the book. So, uh, Connor, what Rick's book. what's that? <laughs> want to test? Well, not necessarily a test, but I want to give these guys a chance. You know, I, I've been hitting you with questions, and of yeah. course, I've been a fan of yours. But so, Shane, John, Connor, at this particular point of the story, did you guys have any questions for uh, for Pete here? Uh, yeah. So one thing that. I found quite interesting was you wrote it as how do I describe it? Like I guess almost a historical fiction. You you write it as as if it was a story rather than a lot of history books I've read. Uh, was that 
was that a choice that you kind of made early on where you thought that I'm going to write it in this way instead of more traditional history book style? Yeah. I've been doing that. Um, I've been uh, out of the Navy and writing books for longer than I was in the Navy. And that was 26 years. When I started the World War II stuff, I would try to find true stories and then write them in such a way that you got the story but I did not want to step on the toes of any of the people, the crews, the widows, the descendants of people who had been killed in these things by doing a regular history book. So I, I fictionalize it, but it's pretty true to what actually happened. And, and my skill at this is that I've been through all of this. I've done a lot of this. So I can make it sound like, you know, I was there and watching. I wasn't. <laughs> you know, I was yeah. born in December 1941. My father used to say I caused World War II because <laughs> I was born in December 1941. But that's the way it comes across. Right. And uh, it's, it's, it's effective because it's real. It is real. Yeah. Do yeah, you? It, oh, oh, go ahead, Connor. Yeah. No, it definitely is effective because when I read the book, needless to say, it made me to go uh, look up the story more because I had heard about the Franklin, but I'd never really dug into it before yeah. I read this book. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a site on YouTube called Drakenfell. Do you guys know it? Yeah, uh, Drakena, yeah, Drakenfell, yeah, Drak. Um, and, and he that well, I don't know how to pronounce it, but he has a segment on the Franklin. Mm -hmm. which has some of the most fascinating black and white photography I've seen of this thing. Uh, plus his sort of dry British humor that, you know, this thing did not go as planned. <laughs> no kidding. It did not go as planned. Uh, but it, it, the whole story, and particularly of the, of the young naval officer that went back into the galley or the mess decks where Two, three hundred people had gathered and they couldn't get out. So he led them out. Yeah. Having gone, first of all, on a tour to see if he could find a way out. Mm -hmm. Is it like a lieutenant or Lieutenant JG? Now, yeah, was that, that was Lieutenant uh, JG. Was that Donald Gary? Gary, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Got the Medal of Honor for it because he not only led them out, now he went back to another space and led more people out. And he went back like three or four times into the inside of the ship because he was a damage control officer. Mm. He knew the ship. He knew all about the ship. Because in damage control, you have to physically, even on something the size of a carrier, you have to walk and pace every passageway, every compartment, every escape route, every ladder, every hatch, you have to know all that in order to fight a fire when somebody calls and says, the reefer deck's burning, where's the reefer deck? He, he knew where the reefer deck was because he'd done all that. And that's one of the main things about damage control. I've been on destroyers. I've not served on a carrier except for a short time in, in the uh, Indian Ocean. I tried to take a tour of that ship. I forget which one it was. I was a Commodore uh, of a squadron of destroyers. I didn't have much to do. So I said, I'm going to tour this carrier. I was aboard for three months. I don't think I saw half of it. <laughs> making, making a constructive effort every day to go somewhere different on this great big aircraft carrier. And going into places like, oh, shit, where the hell am I? Getting on a telephone. So it says right here I'm on the fourth deck, this frame, this compartment. <laughs> help, help, you know. And somebody would come get me. And that's what it was like on these, on these great big ships. But this guy, the damage control assistant, had done that. That's how he got these people out. It was, it's, it's just, wow. you know, astonishing. Yeah. Um, did you guys have any uh, other questions before I move on to the captain? Yeah, I have oh, a... Go ahead, Shane. Yeah. I, sorry, I have a quick thought, and it's 
<clears throat> it's very pertinent. Uh, welcome, Captain. Thanks for being here. And thank you for your sacrifices and writing these books. Fabulous stuff. Um, so I was reading through the real history through the Na uh, Naval History and Heritage Command, the, the damage report for the Franklin. And I was excited to read that uh, us at the Buffalo Naval Park, we are home to uh, the destroyer USS the Sullivans, which during World War II was part of uh, Destroyer Squadron uh, 52. Right. And I was reading in the real history that the USS Miller and the USS Hickok, which were both part of Deseron 52, were there doing a, a damage control, and then they were uh, steaming astern of the ship, picking up survivors uh, in the wake of the ship. But I believe in your book, you changed the name of the USS Miller. Now, I know this isn't a technical question, and I hope to learn more sure. about uh, some other things, but uh, I don't remember what you called the destroyer, but it wasn't USS Miller DD-535. Was that a, con do you remember? Uh, yes, was, yes, it, it is a conscious decision. In all of my books, I try to make sure, like I said, that I don't step on the toes or the memories of the people from the real ships. And I get away with it by saying, eh, it's fiction, you know? But I have hundreds of emails from people who say, my grandfather, my father, my uncle, my older brother, and they would never talk about it. And having read your book, I now understand what they went through. Thank you very much, because I could never find out from them. Mm. So I changed names. I changed names of the admirals, the commodores, the captains. Uh, the captain of this ship was a was a problem child. It was Gary's, and uh, but I didn't use that name in the book, just because I don't want to hear from some some grandson saying you have slandered my father and or my grandfather and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there he is. It reminds me of uh, was it, uh, Gary, just looking mm -hmm. at it. Herman Gary. <laughs> he acted like he acted like Herman Gary. You know his story. He was an admiral. In the yeah, he, he took a demotion so that he could serve on the carrier, correct? So he could get command yeah. of a carrier. Great big guy. Yeah. That doesn't do him credit. Great big burly guy. And when he went through the ship, he'd have a Marine ahead of him and a Marine behind him. And they yelled, gangway, gangway, captain coming through. And people had to flatten themselves against the passageways so that this guy could get through. And they thought, well, that's kind of rude. Why don't you say excuse me or something? Not him. What Not in him. your in your research for this book and and obviously you know when you dig into the past of people like the the captain here, um, and then you decide to write it in a you know with a historical fiction approach. Yeah, I I can definitely understand. You're going to get emails. You're going to get letters. Hey, thanks for telling this story. My father never talked about this. Hey, thanks for telling this story. I never really knew what my uncle or great uncle did. I just knew they were on the Franklin, never knew what they went through. But not all of those comments, not all of those letters, not all of those emails uh, can be positive. You had to get some negative criticism too. Never did. Never In did. all the books I've done from World War II, I've gotten some nitpicking. Like you said, this was a hell diver or a hell cat. Yeah, yeah. I didn't go, I've, I've made those mistakes. But those are mistakes I make in telling the story. I have never received an email saying, you bastard, you made my father, you made this ship look bad and all that. Never. Boy, never. Shane, how great would that be not to get negative comments, huh? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, and, and thank you, Ken. Yeah. Now, mistakes is something else. I make mistakes. And uh, they all swear I love the damn book, but you, you said X, and X wasn't true until such and such. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I say go menisai, and uh, I'll fix it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, any other questions, guys, before we uh, move on to the rest of the part of the story? I've got a quick question, yeah. Go um, for it. So this was... Uh, I was telling the guys earlier, I haven't read a book this fast or 
been addicted to a book in a very long time, like I was yours. So great job. Now, since you did just recently write this and the World War II generation is sadly fading, did you have access to any firsthand interviews with Franklin Crew, or were, for the most part, were they gone by the time you decided to write this? No, but my father was a lieutenant commander, was a lieutenant at the uh, Boston Naval Shipyard when Pearl Harbor happened. And he immediately transferred to the USS San Juan, which was a light cruiser with a bunch of five inch guns on it. He served on that for a year and a half, came back to Boston, took command of the USS Cogswell, which was a Fletcher class destroyer. From there, he became a division commander. From there, he became a squadron commander. And uh, from 43 to 46, he was out there. And so as I grew up, he would tell me stories. And I would, I talked to him about the Franklin. And I said, what, you know, uh, what can you tell me that's not in the, in the literature? And he said, well, let me tell you about the skipper, because I knew him. Well, you know, these guys knew each other. They were all Naval Academy graduates. No OCS, no reservists. And, uh, yeah, at the command level. So I got a lot of, of information and insight about how it worked on a carrier and what was important and what was not important. And what was important was if the Admiral said, I want every plane that you that is flyable on your carrier to launch tomorrow morning because we're going to go hit the kamikaze bases. And that's what happened in this case. And Gary said every plane got it, which is why they ended up with armed and gas planes down on the hangar deck, which they never do, uh, because every damn plane was going to go. And they were, they were launching when this happened. Uh, but, the, but I have sources like that, or I did. My dad's passed away now. But I've lived as a Navy junior and lived in the presence of an uncle, my father, uh, my older brother was a submariner in the Navy. My younger brother was a destroyer officer in the Navy. So we're a Navy family. We know lots of Navy people. And when we get together, you'd hear these stories. Uh, and so I've got that advantage. Research is, is good. But I can remember somebody saying, this guy, Gary, was, was a world-class jerk. That guy, you know? Yeah. Well, and I... And, and you and, I mean, he was. Yeah. yeah, and I've even looked up uh, YouTube videos of veterans of the, um, you know, sailors that served aboard the Franklin, and they would tell the story. They would, you know, talk about, uh, you know, whether it was the, you know, putting the fires out or getting the carrier back to New York. You know, they would yeah. tell that story. But when it came to the captain... They all pretty much said, yeah, I don't really have anything good to say about him. Yeah. <laughs> or, or yeah, I don't really have anything to say about the captain that they, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't say anything uh, right. about that, which pretty much speaks volumes. Yes, they it just, does. Yeah. They just did not like the guy and he, he, treated, like the guy he treated them terribly. He didn't like them. And yeah. now I remember he took over a new commission ship, which was manned by a bunch of boots recruits. And so they knew nothing, and he literally would be down on the flight deck berating them like Simon Legree. Is, you know, how come you don't know this? Well, sir, nobody told me this. You know, I don't care, and just like that. He had, I think I put it in the book, the telephones. He yes. had telephones installed in some of the senior officers' room, and he'd call to see if they were there or if they were out doing their job. And of course, all the department heads figured this out real quick. So if the phone rang while the department head was in his office, he'd point at some sailor and then he'd leave the room so the sailor wouldn't lie. No, sir, he's not here, sir. Well, where is he? Well, he's out on deck, sir. He's somewhere, blah, 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 you know. I mean, <laughs> that's crazy. So, that, so that's not a liberty. That's not a liberty you took. You, there was actually, that's actually. A, that's, yeah, that actually happened. Really? Yeah, that wow. actually happened. And he, he raped because, these guys. 
I, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's those small details that you throw into the story that, well, and, and John said, you know, it, it was a quick read. It's fascinating. I mean, I read it fast and I'm a slow reader, but it's those slow, it's those small details that I found so fascinating, but I was kind of under the assumption that Making you know, it up. these are things you made up to kind of fill in some, some gaps. No, no they're not. They're not. And, and some of the things that happened that day uh, were so bizarre. You, you, as they say, you can't make this stuff up. And uh, the, the Naval History Division has log accounts, the, the after action reports, the sailors having to take mops down onto the hangar deck to mop up the carbonized remains. Now, mops on ships are called swabs. And you have a bucket, and you have a rinsing bucket, and you got a bucket with an arm on it to clean the swab off. That's how they picked up the remains of the people on, on a lot of parts of the ship. And all they could do was pour it over the side. And there were people who had mental problems. We call it PTSD now but had mental problems for doing that. These were, these were guys whom they knew, with whom they had worked, that they were mopping smears of carbon off the hangar deck, pouring them over the side, no gunfire salute, no flags, no nothing, because there were so many and they were all dead and it smelled bad. When she got into Pearl Harbor, People wouldn't go aboard the ship because it smelled so bad. Yeah, you you had even made a a reference to that after the carrier did pull into Pearl Harbor. There was a, uh, I believe, a, a JAG officer that you had written into the story that came aboard, and you immediately handed him a jar of Vicks Vapor Rub to put under his yeah. nose to, uh, which I now that I believe. Well, we yeah. carried Vicks on on my ship, uh, the Corman. If there was a compartment somebody had to go into where people had been burned to death or destroyed, which I did not experience, Vix is very good for that. Mm -hmm. Little dab will do you. <laughs> now, after they after they got the fire out, and of course this is a, an image of the deck, you know, uh, the bow, the what the front third totally destroyed. You can see the elevators, I believe, were Stern. total. Stern. I'm sorry. Stern. Stern. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's the stern right there. That's right. Because all crew gathered on the bow because that was the only, yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Right. Um, but quarter view. Yeah. And uh, so, but both ele the, the elevators in this picture, a picture, they were both blown out as well from the, uh, By the that explosion on the hangar bay. Yeah. They were blown into the air and came back down into their holes and went down below. And those are flight deck segments. They are elevators. Mm -hmm. And those are not trivial pieces of metal. No. Mm -hmm. They were both seen in the air. There was one, what was it? I just uh, reread this. There was one major component of the ship back aft that was blown so high into the air they lost sight of it. And then they realized it was going to come back down. Mm. And guys were running all over the place, and it did come back down. It went through the flight deck. Mm. Something big. I don't remember what it was, but uh. <laughs> well, and in 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 many cases, or probably all the cases, after the fire was put out, all the aircraft that were on the deck, this is pretty much all that was left. Yeah, just piles of metal, junk with, with, with live ordnance. You know, a lot of the bombs, uh, bombs on an airplane typically are not armed. Like, like uh, if you're going to take off and go attack somebody, the bombs are underneath the wings. You have to pull a couple lanyards, and then the pilot has to pull a final lanyard, which opens up something called a spinner up on the front of the bomb, 500-pound bomb, 1,000-pound bomb. The spinner doesn't move until he pulls his final wire, and he doesn't pull that till he drops it. This is a counter to make sure the bomb doesn't go off right underneath the airplane. A lot of the bombs on this thing melted. Many of them burned. A few of them actually went off. But for the most part, they burned. Or they leaked and did not burn. 
So a pile of wreckage like that could have a thousand pounds of TNT looking like a shellac mm -hmm. on the flight deck. Now you go clean that up. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I was I was reading in the uh, in the after after action or the damage. Yeah. Uh, the damage. Um, Sorry, I'm blanking on the name. That about 60 of the 65 500 pound bombs uh, during uh, this day in March uh, went off on the ship. Can yeah. you imagine 60 500 pound bombs exploding right. or melting or, you know, creating all of that smoke mm -hmm. and uh, creating a lot of damage on board? But you sure. just can imagine. Direct hits. <laughs> yeah, they're direct hits, right? Right direct on the hits. deck or exactly. uh, in the hangar the direct deck. Direct infill uh, black and white videos show minutes of that. Yeah. One after wham, 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 wham. It's unbelievable. Would you be able to talk about, uh, again, Captain, thank you for being here. Would you be able to talk about the damage control adjustments that they made when they were in the yard? Uh, in Puget Sound and how that helped uh, the ship uh, stay afloat because uh, they made some changes to the damage control systems. Yes, they uh, did. Adding, they didn't, you know, they didn't help. Fire mains. They didn't help because all of the piping, the, the, the spray systems, they had these water curtains yeah. between the three segments of the hangar bay. But all the piping was out on the bulkheads in the hangar deck. And when the big bang went, when the hangar deck blew up, all that piping was blown off the bulkheads. Mm -hmm. So now all you had was water leaking out of the water mains and not doing any good at all. Any good at all. On the Forestall fire, um, most of that damage was on the flight deck. But some of it got down into the, into the hangar bay but they had operable uh, fire curtain systems, which they could turn on and turn the atmosphere in the hangar bay into a monsoon. So nothing could really get going and do a Franklin. That, that was the term of art when the uh, forest all fire report came up. We didn't do a Franklin. <laughs> mm -hmm. wow. but, on, but on Franklin, when that big explosion took place, all the fancy valves, and, and water curtain systems were were obliterated. Mm. And that's why it it didn't work. Now this one one airplane that that caught fire on the hangar deck, which is what this was designed for. Mm. First of all, the bomb went off down there, and then all twelve or thirteen of these planes went off simultaneously. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's so catastrophic that no system, oh, that is, correct. Whether, it's, yeah. whether it's brand new or three years old, would not be able to survive. And the guys down in Damage Control Central before they had to evacuate because the smoke got down there. Uh, and, and DC Central, which is the nerve center for doing damage control, was, was evacuated early on. They couldn't stay there. Mm. All the damage control plates, as they're called, which show number one engine room, number two fire room. There's big 36 by 48 inch drawings on the wall. And you got guys down there with grease pencils. This is broken. This is broken as a fire here. And that's how they control the firefighting efforts. Uh, they were all wrong. They were all the old ones. Because the shipyard wow. never gave them new ones. Yeah. Yeah. And I know about that because I had the same thing happen, happen to me. Yeah, and I think you had even mentioned in the story, in the book, the two ensigns that were tasked with trying to ta uh, tackle and track these lines. They were, you know, when, sweet when and sour, right? Yeah, oh, sweet yeah, and sweet sour, and yeah. Sour. Ensign, ensign sweet and ensign yeah, sour. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when they were asked, it's like, so how much is accurate and how much? And they said, I, I don't know, 50 50? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, the chief engineer would, would crap his pants 50 50. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's what it looks like to us. Oh, my God. But I love that interaction, you know, when they were talking to the office. I don't remember if it was uh, Gary or 
<clears throat> but they still said your work has been invaluable. Continue to do it. So you're you're not as a as a motivational thing. Yes. You're still keeping them positive and keeping the experience of reporting, even if it's 50 50, that they're not going to get slapped across the wrist or no, you know, that, telling you're, that you keep. Gary's would have. Now, Gary's would have yeah. slapped them across the face. But in, in naval leadership, Gary's would have been called by people who have had command a screamer. Mm -hmm. Gary's was a screamer. You've got a prince. Or you got a screamer. The prince is the guy that you'll follow into hell. And I've had a couple skippers like that. I just, God, I loved them. I'd do anything for them because they never ever reacted that way. Even when I'd screwed up, I'd say, okay, Pete, what do you think you did wrong? Well, sir, uh, you know, <laughs> and they say, okay, here's what, here's where you went wrong. I understand how this happened because this was so and this was so. Now, what you got to do is relearn X and Y and never do that again. Yes, sir. Never again. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Three bags full. But you wanted to get it right the next time as opposed to some guy saying, you dumb ass. You know, yap, 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 yap. It doesn't work. The leadership doesn't work that way. It's got to be positive. It's got to be you and me. We're going to fix this. And I'm sorry. You got embarrassed by your own error, but I understand it. You're going to experience, I've been there before. I've done this myself like that. And then the guy will do his utmost to do it better the next time. Mm -hmm. Now, now as bad as Captain Garris was, uh, you know, you had uh, exceptional guys like we talked about, Lieutenant JG, Donald Gary, but then you also had this guy. The chaplain. Uh, Father Joe O'Callaghan, who you make a point of mentioning in your book that he just seemed to be everywhere. He was. Um, if it wasn't extraordinary guy. Yeah, yeah. If, it, if it wasn't taking on, uh, you know, leading uh, groups to take on fires, he was also caring for for wounded and giving those without hope, you know, last rites. So I, this guy was everywhere and. Is this the actual photo of him? Yes. Yeah, that's him. And that's as him. well as I think this is also him possibly performing a service after, Whoa. you know, as, as we had what O'Callaghan was, he was the ship's chaplain. Now the carrier had a Catholic, a Protestant, and a Jewish chaplain because there were 3,000 people on board. Okay. But everybody knew that the chaplain the go-to guy was o'callahan he had an extraordinary background uh very accomplished and so it was no surprise that he did all these things during the emergency nobody was surprised to see o'callahan mm. at, the, at the head of a fire hose nobody because that's the kind of guy he was they all knew him they loved him they went to him whether you were jewish or protestant or not if you could catch Father Joe, you, you talked to him and, and got what you needed from him. He was famous aboard the ship long before this happened. And he was eventually, after all this, he was eventually, I believe he was one of the Medal of Honor winners, correct? They had to force him into it. He said when, when, they, when he was nominated, I'm a chaplain, Medal of Honor go to combatant fighters to line officers to people who did x and y and who were responsible for the air group and for the ship and the president himself said hey i've heard about you from everybody on the franklin you will accept this award well let's let's downgrade it a little bit because it's just not right that a chaplain gets the medal of honor and they all just laughed at him and said stand tall mm-hmm that actually happened. He was that kind of guy. So, so they basically gave him an order and say, "Hey, yes, here, here's your medal. <laughs> here's your medal. Here's the now, medal." Now, the after medal. after the fires put out, I obviously it goes to Pearl Harbor, and then from then on, it goes through the Panama Canal to get back to New York. And yeah. oh my god, yeah, yeah, where you know something 
a ship like this damaged to this extent, you would almost expect it to, you know, just be scrapped in, in place. But in your book, Trial by Fire, and by the way, this, this guy that we're listening to is P.T. Duderman. He's the one that wrote Trial by Fire. That's why we're having him on tonight. Um, and, and we're glad to have you here. <coughs> in your book, you write about the fact that they actually wanted to kind of stick it to the Japanese to get the ship back to New York to get it uh, essentially rebuilt and back to sea. Was that, is, is that accurate? Yes, it was. I mean, it made no sense to repair this ship. The damage was so extensive and the war, everybody knew the war was coming to a close, except, except <laughs> there was a plan for an invasion. And the invasion was going to be a, uh, an Olympic effort to go into Japan and finally defeat the Japanese. None of these people had any knowledge of the atomic bomb. And so the, the war was expected to continue into 1946 by everybody out there in the Pacific. So it was easier to repair Franklin, but there was an element of we want the Franklin to go back out there and for the Japanese to see her. Having seen her essentially immolation, they wanted to see that America could take a ship like that, fix it, bring it back out there. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I take pills and they go off. Um, <laughs> but uh, see, they, they knew the Japanese hunted this ship for a couple days trying to find her to finish her off. Um, and it, God damn it, here she is again. She's back launching airplanes. Look at yeah. that. How can we possibly win against a nation that can do that to a ship that was so mortally wounded? Bring her back out, all the way back, because that's what they plan to do. Bring her all the way back out to the Pacific and participate in the invasion. So the Japs got to see her. <laughs> kind, of, kind of like a similar approach to, wasn't it the Yorktown that uh, they sent back? and then turned it around. Nimitz wanted it back out in like three days. Yes. Uh, yeah, I forget exactly. Was that? Well, that was that was pure necessity. That no, was necessity. You know, the, oh, the, you know what? Good point. Good That's way. a very good point. Yeah, because there were only like three or four carriers available. So well, they had to do that. Really, and, and York John had been damaged. And, and he said, look, Band-Aid how you can, but I need you up here because we're going to surprise these guys. Mm -hmm. And Boy, did they. But you know, the Japanese carriers at Midway were not sunk by naval aviation. They were all four. Akagi, Hiryu, Soryu, and Kaga. They were all four set ablaze, just like Franklin was. They were in no danger of sinking, but they were wrecked. The planes couldn't land on them. I mean, they were on flame from one side to the other. It was the Japanese who actually ordered them sunk. People mm -hmm. think, you know, they went down because of the bombings. They did not. Mm -hmm. They did not. They were all afloat, and the Jap destroyers were sent in with torpedoes to put them under underwater because they didn't want to leave them there for the Americans to find. Same deal as, as Franklin. Franklin was never in any danger of sinking. But she was wrecked. Well, PT, you know, I heard your, I heard your alarm go off. You got to go take your pills, and we've had you yeah. on for an hour. <laughs> hey, you I'm, I'm going to be eighty-two this year. Pills are good for you. Well, I mean, we definitely appreciate you not only coming on, but even kind of waiting your way through the technical aspects to even join us tonight. So I, I can't can't thank you enough, and. And thanks for trading emails with me to, you know, get you scheduled to come on and talk about trial by fire. Um, it's it's been great having you here. Uh, yeah. Thanks well, so I, much. Kevin. I'm addicted to YouTube, and, and in fact, <laughs> when I'm supposed to be writing, I'm typically on YouTube saying, "Look at this, God, I never knew that." Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm glad to get your channel, and I've subscribed to it actually. Um, oh, I appreciate that. Well, yeah, I mean this this is neat. So uh, anytime, anytime. Yeah. Well, you, let man. me uh, 
let me give you a couple of mentions in here. First of all, we've been we've been talking about PT's book Trial by Fire again, uh, totally focused on the bombing of the carrier USS Franklin in 1945. It's a fantastic book. I read it uh, a while ago and then recommended that we work that into tonight's episode about damage control. So had Shane, John, Connor read the book. I actually then got the audio book from Amazon and listened to it all over again. And it was great. So in the link of the description for this video, if you are interested in Trial by Fire by P.T. Duterman, check out the description of the video and uh, you should find the link to the book there. Also, you can check out PT at his website, www.ptduterman.com. You see it there with two N's. Connor, thanks for bringing that up. PT Duterman with two N's.com. Check out his website because he, uh, I think it was last year, wrote and published this book, The Last Paladin, which is, again, fascinating. Uh, yeah, it was right around a year ago, right, P uh, PT, yeah. that you published this? Uh, about a destroyer escort during World War II based on a true story. And I don't want to give the story away because it's fantastic, but I really enjoyed it. And so if you enjoyed having PT on here tonight and want to check out some other books, check out The Last Paladin that came out about a year ago. And what's this other book that you've got coming out next? The next one is about Iwo Jima. And it's the story of a naval officer on a battleship that was offshore Iwo Jima. And in the first five days, things got so bad that the Marines needed a guy who was familiar with spotting for naval gunfire support. Marines have guys who are trained to call a battleship or a cruiser and say, okay, I'm in deep trouble. Here are my coordinates. This is where the guy is. Could you please place nine 16 inch or 14 inch rounds on his head? And now it would be nice. And this guy <laughs> goes ashore, and you get to experience what it was like on Ima for the first six weeks, which is all supposed to be all done in one week. And it, the research was amazing. I thought I knew all about it, and I did not. And uh, the book will put you right there. Um, and it, you, you, it's just, it is unbelievable, but I hopefully make it believable. What, what's the book called and when does it come out? It's called Evo 26 Charlie. Any naval gunfire support spotter who is ashore, Marine or Army, is given the call sign 26 Charlie. Now it might be Mayflower 26 Charlie, Chicago 26 Charlie, but it always has 26 Charlie in it. As part, uh, you immediately know that's a spotter. That's a guy in the weeds with binoculars staring at an entire division of Japanese or Germans or whatever the hell coming right at him and he needs help, help, help from mm -hmm. some offshore ship. Mm -hmm. And he'll call the ship and he'll say, in this case, Nevada, the battleship Nevada, this is, this is, you know, Anchorage 26 Charlie, lay it on me. Yeah, and there's a, and there's a, uh, there's a, there's a code called the talk. It's not a security code, it's a procedural code. So he'll call up and he'll say, target, very range, composition, many, 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 many. You can tell from the tone in the, in the guy's voice that he's in dire straits. And then he'll call for fire. And the ship will shoot a couple shells, and the guy will say, no, 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 no. Come left 1,000. Come up 50 feet. Drop 500 yards. Try it again. Bang. All right, close. And then he'll give it the same coordinates again until the ship rounds are landing right on the problem. And then he'll say, <laughs> it's kind of funny, he'll say, go on. Go on. <laughs> But here it comes. Give me 10 rounds of 14-inch. Go on. 
But this is all explained in the book, and it, it, it's uh, it's a great story. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. It's, it's, no. So, so it's called EO Two Six Charlie, and when when should we be expecting it? November of this year. November. Got it. Right. Uh, before we let uh, before we let go, uh, Pete go and take his pills, guys. Did you have any last uh, last questions for him before we, uh, Pete? Before we kick you off and talk behind your back. Oh, that's <laughs> you um, to come up here and bring the pills. <laughs> Connor, um, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, well, first off, I just want to thank you for, again, thank you for coming tonight. Um, and I'm really looking forward to reading more of your books because uh, and I showed these guys before the call. I have like a whole lineup of books I need to finish, but it's about to become more. <laughs> uh, uh, but basically, one thing I'd ask is for anyone who's interested in writing uh, a historical book like this, or not, not his, like, you know, a historical fiction type book, would there be any be would there be any advice you would recommend to these people? Like anything that you've learned, like starting from your first book up to where you are now? Well, I started in, in 1992. And I get a, I've gotten a lot of questions about people from people who have a story and they want to they want to write a book, but they're put off by the fact that uh, in some cases I can't type or uh, the computer scares me a little bit, or what's the format? And the, the fundamental question that authors, would-be authors have is, who am I to think that I can write a book? It's a question of confidence, because a lot of folks say, uh, you know, I got this great story, but I can't write a book. And what I tell them is, Pretend you're in a bar with a bunch of your buddies. You're having drinks and sitting at the bar and you're telling lies and sea stories and whatever. And you tell your guys, your friends, you say, hey, I got this story. And you're not going to believe this, but I've got this story. And you tell them the story. You don't have to write it. There's no grammar involved. There's no punctuation. There's no format. You just tell the story and have in your pocket a voice activated tape recorder. And you pretend that you're sitting at the bar telling your buddies. And you know, when you tell stories like that, you put voices in there. You change the voices. And I said this, and this guy, bah, bah, bah. put all that in it. Put all that in it. Record it. Then go down to the courthouse and ask for the room where all the court recorders are. Hand one of them the tape recorder and say, I'll pay you a dollar a page to put this down in a manuscript. <laughs> and, they'll do it. They'll do it. and they'll do it faithfully. They'll do it faithfully that the witness said vehemently, the witness got very, I mean, they do that for a living. And now what you have is called a manuscript. It's so insane. basically, basically what you're doing is for those people that are trying to make excuses, well, I can't type yeah. or, you know, you're taking away the opportunity for them to make an excuse, uh, yeah. you know, so just talking to a recorder and then give it to a, uh, uh, a court reporter, yeah, a stenographer or whatever. Then you yeah. got a manuscript and they'll do yeah. a double space, triple space, they'll do it any format you want. <laughs> now, the second part, if you want to get it published is you must find an agent. Publishers used to have this thing called over the transom. Over the transom meant you threw the manuscript over the front door of the publishing house into what was called the slush pile. The slush pile. The junior editor who had pissed off the senior editor got to go through the slush pile and see if there were any jewels in there whatsoever. And once in a while they'd find one. That's all gone. You must have an agent to get a book in front of a publisher. There's a book for that. Yeah, I would say there's an app for that, but there's a book for that. It's called Guide to Literary Agents in North America. It comes out every year. It's in the library, and it describes all the agents and what kind of stuff they handle. Got a children's book, got a horror story, got vampires, got naval history. What do you got? Go get this guy, and if, 
if you can convince him that what you've got is worthwhile, he'll convince a publisher to take it on. That's what, how you can publish. What about self-publishing on Amazon? I'm sorry, I know you probably had to go take your Lipitor. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, I'm right here, and yeah. I, I've got just exactly what I need to take it with. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, so then you stumble across, you know, you talk about agents and everything and Connor asked this question. It's like, well, you know, if he has a friend that wants to write a book and everything like that, but what about, you know, I, I hear a lot about self-publishing through something like Amazon. What's your yeah. opinion on that? I mean, if you've got somebody that has a story that, and I'm sure this happens to you all the time, or like Connor mentioned, you know, uh, you know, if somebody wants to do it, um, isn't self-publishing an option for, for those folks? Sure. Self-publishing is an option. Um, but if you want to hit the New York publishing scene, if you want to have an entire floor of editors looking at your stuff, mm -hmm. if you want to have a publicity department, if you want to have an editor who'll say, hey, this is great, but you've got the wrong voice, or this is great, but God, man, do you keep saying the word again, again, and again, and again, and again, you know, like that, the pros. This is this not necessarily the big time, but the professionals. You need an agent, and the agent will tell you this is not ready for prime time. But he'll also tell you, he or she, that here's how to fix it. It's invaluable. It's invaluable. You know, I, I started publishing. I was a retired naval officer. I had a great story. And I was in London at the time, and I'd written the story, and, and I had a friend who had an agent. He gave it to the agent. The agent came back and said, you got three great books here. It was an 850-page manuscript. I thought, more is better. And he said, no. <laughs> Try something shorter. You can, you can write. You have the knowledge. But <laughs> this is ridiculous. I didn't know it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It was great. You know, it was a tone. I couldn't carry it, uh, but but that's how you get, you get in. The agents are the filter. If you can't convince an agent to take the work, it's not worth publishing, okay. self or otherwise. Wade, uh, Wade, one of the viewers tonight asked if uh, you know he's not familiar with your book. So if he wanted to start reading uh, your collection of books, give us a recommendation. Where do they start? Pacific Glory. There's oh one yeah. The, yep. It, uh, it won the National Best Military Fiction Award, called the Boyd Award, uh, and it's 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 a it's a really good human story about war. Uh, I'd say start with that one, and then move forward for the World War II stuff. There's there's a dozen of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go to the website. Each each book is described on the website. Let's see. There you go. Um, yeah. 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 So, and I think the one that I started with was actually Ghosts of Bungo Sweeto. I think right. that was, yeah. I think That's that was the first book I had read. Right. The World War II, the, the, the thrillers was me trying to get used to professional writing. I had no problem with the writing, but I couldn't figure out where the market was. And then I did Pacific Lore, and there was the market right there. That one did very well, won awards, and it's a basic story of Leyte Gulf. But uh, after that, I went, I went with the Navy stuff. You know, write about what you know. Yeah. Well, and, and it definitely shows in the books that, you know, I've read of yours. Uh, the Hooligans, if you like PT Boats, I, I enjoyed that a lot. That was fantastic. So, uh, yeah, we the uh, we might uh, might need to have you on again <laughs> soon. Um, Wade, thanks for that question. Uh, any last questions for uh, PT before uh, we kick him off? No, just thank you so much for being here. Hey, my pleasure. It was it was fun. Yeah, it was it was great to have you on here. And uh, one last uh, mention uh, for those of you if you enjoyed having uh, PT on with us, check out his website, PT Duderman with two ends, ptduderman.com, and check out all his books. Uh, PT, thanks for joining us tonight. Definitely appreciate uh, the uh, time you gave us, which was a heck of a lot longer than I thought it would be. So uh, it was fascinating. Okay, well, that's great. And, and I have subscribed and I will visit often.
Fantastic. All right, we're going to kick kick you off and talk behind your back. Okay. <laughs> All right. You. you have a good evening. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was great. Yeah, what'd you think? That was a lot I of like, fun. It was a lot oh, of so fun. So we literally are talking behind his back. Okay. Well, uh, we have we haven't we haven't ended the broadcast yet. No, no <laughs> that's true. We still uh, need to talk about what you guys are doing. Some but. sometimes you just need to just sit back and just let someone talk. And tonight was that kind of night. Just I could listen to him talk for hours. That's a good call, you know, Frank. I didn't know what to think. Um, you know, I've I've been a fan of his books. I've read a lot of his books, and of course, we we're talking about this tonight. But then, of course, there's that old adage: um, "You never want to meet." <laughs> what is it? You never want to meet the. Never want to meet the yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. And even though we had challenges, you know, getting him on connected tonight, I was uh, glad that he was there. I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I could could have listened yeah. to him talk all all night tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, don't forget for those of you that, you know, are interested in his writing and for those of you that are that have been interested in what, you know, John Epp has had to say about the Slater, don't forget PT's book. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Um, so the one that came out a year ago, The Last Paladin, which is a really, you know, just in the same way he told the story of the franklin and I'm the bombing right what's that I'm looking it up right now <laughs> oh yeah yeah so the last paladin you know came out about a year ago and it's all about a destroyer escort before tonight's broadcast i actually mentioned it to john the name of the destroyer escort is fictional but john immediately knew the story that pt duderman was basic basing it on so if you're looking for another book to read, I highly recommend it. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, all right. So with that said, now we get to move on to, because we're not done yet. Now we get to move on to see what's going on with the uh, Buffalo Naval Park, the USS Slater, and the Alexander Henry. Who wants to start? Shane, you want to kick it off? What's going on with the uh, with the Buffalo Naval Park? Yeah, sure. Uh well, you know, uh, we are just kind of in our season now. Uh, there's a, you know, we're pretty active. Uh, there's a lot going on. I'm doing these add-on tours uh, every other Thursday and Friday, gun tours and weapons control tours for the guided missile systems. Uh, so those are going really well. Uh, there's a lot of good news, uh, and I'll be pretty vague, but there's some good news about us getting another Talos missile. Uh, from South Bend, Indiana, and we are going to make a big splash about that. Uh, so we're securing funding now, and uh, we'll place it on board the Little Rock where it belongs. And uh, we'll be able to fill out our wing and fin room a little bit as well. Uh, so the cat's not out of the bag yet, uh, but you'll see it uh, as when we actually put the boots on the ground, get the missile and the booster itself. Uh, and that's in South Bend, Indiana. Then also looking at Groton, Connecticut. Uh, there's some, uh, we're making some headway with what we believe is the Croker Periscope. Uh, yeah. that if I've, did I, have I said that before? I can't remember. I don't remember if you said on stream or off stream, to be honest. We talked for like two hours after last show. <laughs> You're oh, yeah. right about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, so, for, for those of you that aren't aware, after we sign off at night, then we end up talking for like another half hour, 45 minutes. And I think Connor's right. Um, you had mentioned, wait, am I even allowed to say it? What? About, about the Periscope? It's well, like behind the yeah, we're, well, uh, all right. Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, the, yeah, the Croker Periscope, uh, we have located. Uh, they cut it off uh, at about 1986 or 87, and they just placed it somewhere. And so uh, there's been revived talk about uh, going to get it. I've been looking at GIS maps, who actually owns that particular parcel along the Thames River, <clears throat> and uh, looking again for some funding sources to uh, potentially go get the 40-foot uh, and it's been verified. The people that I've talked to have said, yes, we were there when they cut the periscope off and laid it 
on the ground. So, uh, but yeah, th that's that's as far as I'll go. But so we got exciting things in Connecticut, exciting things in uh, Indiana, and so I'm kind of manage, you know, just managing and getting those projects off the ground and things like that. So, for my own end, it's uh, tours and these two large projects. But we are also doing movies on the Fantail now called Fantail Flicks. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have, I think we're doing seven movies. So it's the first year. We get about 15 or 20 people per uh, per movie, and uh, that's and it's free. So uh, that's pretty nice. Frank, Frank says, talk about Shane's... Uh july 16th video oh geez <laughs> What's that? okay every, uh, we uploaded okay so very quickly 716 is buffalo's area code so but it's also uh, a it's like a 36 hour uh go fund me kind of thing for about 600 community organizations around buffalo sponsored by uh the buffalo bills foundation and the buffalo sabers foundation so they opened up they opened up the Bills Stadium and they opened up the Sabres Arena this year for us to do filming uh, for the 716. And it starts at 716 in the morning on July 16th and then runs for 36 hours uh, and ends at 716 at night. And so it's it's kind of a drive where then the foundation matches uh, certain monies if someone gives to a community organization as I said, it's not just us there's about 600 community organizations that are taking advantage of this uh but we just up we did so we did a promotional video on youtube uh and that was uploaded today it's pretty funny you know it's me being uh my my Ooh. normal charming and uh kind of off the chart self so check <laughs> that out everybody thank you frank i appreciate it where, where would people go to learn more about that? Would they go to buffalonavalpark.org? Uh, yeah, I think there's a give seven one, just give 716.org. Okay. I, I think, I'm sorry, I should know that, but I think it's give 716 that you probably just look it up on DuckDuckGo or Google or something. And uh, but thank it. you. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a fun video because uh, we can go into the locker rooms of the sports teams and things like that. So, so Shane Stevenson, curator of the Buffalo Naval Park, to learn more about the Buffalo Naval Park, definitely check out their website, www.buffalonavalpark.org, but also search for the YouTube channel. It's simple. Just go on the search bar and type in Buffalo Naval Park and their content will come up. The uh, the videos, uh, Shane started to post uh, some YouTube shorts, which I think are pretty interesting. So definitely check them out. Uh, like I said, check them out on YouTube and search for Buffalo Naval Park. Uh, moving on to John Epp. USS Slater, what do you guys got coming up? Uh, so since our last broadcast, we had the final. That was like a pretty home. big sigh, you know. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> is it because you're so busy over there, or is it because, well, probably because you're busy? <sighs> oh, I make myself busy. I got a billion little projects going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, the couple days after our final, our last broadcast, we had uh, Dustless final reunion. Uh, so that was oh, a big right. shebang. Um, I had a very, very large turnout for that. It was a lot of fun. Got to, um, got to meet some World War II DE vets, including one who was um, on the Chatelaine, and he helped capture U-505, so we gave a speech at our banquet. Uh, he was firing his depth charges at U-505, and he ran out of depth charges. No, so he, no all he, kidding. All he could do is watch. And um, apparently he threw his depth charge the, the wrench you said the depth he threw it at U five hundred five because he was frustrated. Wow. Um, what else do we got going on? Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, we've been busy with tours. Uh, August, the biggest thing we have going on in August is August fourth, Coast Guard birthday. We'll have a little celebration at the museum, um, and then September, of course, is Hensa, which we're mm -hmm. very much yeah. looking forward to. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, uh, John, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, when you say f we have one big event in the month of August, is that kind well, of relatively, like, common for you? I mean, do you have – like, how many events do you have, if, if there is any? How many events do you have, like, a when, week? When, when, I say a, when I say a big event, I mean, like, you know, 50 people. 
We we don't no, no, do but, events. Uh, no, I'm understanding that. But like, you have one event a month that you guys do on board, or uh, like, no, you have... it's special dates. So the first one of the year that we always do is DE Day. So it's in June. It's the National Destroy Escort Day. We're the only one who celebrates it now. Yeah. Um, July, we don't really have anything. August, we celebrate Coast Guard Day. Um, September. I don't think we usually have anything in September that I recall off the top of the head, except this year we do. Yeah. October is busy for us. Uh, November. What about your overnights? Like, you're, I mean, you're still doing overnights, right? Yeah, we don't do those in the summertime, though. It's just too hot. So ah, we stop okay. in early June. We pick it up late August, early September. Okay. So, like, do you have events that, say, are not sponsored by you guys, but that other groups around Albany or that Tri-City or whatever you say – uh do you have people renting like you know i mean it seems though for the buffalo naval park we have seven events a week from organizations that <laughs> want to do something and i don't think i'm i don't think i'm lying i mean you know we have no i believe i've seen your guys tables yeah. you know that do you, so do you get other organizations coming to you and say we want to do an event here at the slater and then you say oh okay we're going to charge you this much money and whatever or, Nope. Um, I, the biggest reason, look at my picture right now. It's a small ship. The parking lot is very tiny as well. So Gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering how you guys, uh, the differences, I guess. Yeah. So a major issue is, yeah, the ship could accommodate 220 some odd guys during the war, but the largest yeah. interior space inside the ship, you can accommodate 50, 75 people, the mess deck. Yeah. So it's hard right. to really have anyone do events. We're also terrified of theft. We're terrified of someone getting hurt because nothing is behind plexiglass. Or anything. Everything is wide open um, because we we want the ship to be 1945. Almost like the crew is tied up in Brooklyn and they're all left for liberty for the weekend. That's mm -hmm. how we would like the ship to look. Mm -hmm. So um, so we we are, because of that, we're 100% self sufficient on ticket sales and gift shop sales and donations. So we can't really. But you have a very, that. you have a relatively very low overhead. Um, average cost estimate is, you know, roughly $1,000 a day operating expenses. Um, that's, so yeah, that's just a rough well. estimate. Yeah. Right. I mean, you have four paid staff people. Is that right? Um, three full time. One part time, and then we also we pay our interns. Um, sure. We have what four or five or six interns usually every year. Wow! <laughs> Just for you specifically? <laughs> no, they're they're our tour guides. They supplement our tour guides. Oh, so, gotcha. Okay, okay. so paid. we have volunteers that do maintenance and restoration. We have uh, volunteers that do tours. Sure, but we got to rely on the college kids to open the ship every morning, keep it clean, uh, run the register and help with tours. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay. See, we have, we have a lot more overhead. All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, That's you have, a... you have, <laughs> you got three <laughs> ships, one of which is, you know, what, three times the size of the Slater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. No, I just, yeah, I was curious because I always like to go to the calendars of other museum ships and. Uh, yeah. oh, yeah. So, you know, Shanna. Uh, yeah. Shanna mentions every once in a while. She's like, this entire museum is ran is run by a group of introverts. I don't like <laughs> I don't like talking to people unless I'm talking about history. I can't stand small talk. Oh my gosh, I hate it. <laughs> well, you're young. Um, yet. You're young. You're, yeah. you're young yet. You'll you'll grow out of that. I think mm -hmm. Tim is very much an introvert as well. So, if you could believe it or not, I'm an introvert as well, but. Uh, my job has forced me to be extroverted and then I come home and I absolutely collapse and don't need to talk to anyone for about, you know, 17 hours before I have to start talking to people again. But yep. no, those, those are things that you, you can grow out of. I was an introvert, you know, and, and then over time you just have to, you know, you don't have to, but you, you develop skills oh, you yeah. know, that you didn't have when you were younger. So yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I would agree with the word introvert. I mean, I would say, you know, you definitely enjoy your alone time. Well, but, oh, are we? Do we want to go? Good thing there's 28 people watching right now. Uh, introversion, extra, introversion, extroversion is 
where do you get your energy from uh, is the is like the technical definition. Yeah. So it's not like I'm quiet or I like to talk. It's if I have a rough day, what do I do to recharge myself? Yeah. Oh, I and see. introverts okay. will retreat, play music, read a book. Extroverts mm-hmm. will get on the phone and say, "Oh, I need a drink. Let's come. Let's go out and have a drink." Mm-hmm. So it's not like I'm a, a big talker. I'm a big quiet person. Um, it's where you go to recharge your batteries and do you retreat into yourself or do you, uh, you know, go outside of yourself looking for help? Oh, I just remembered something. I what? just, uh, just came to us last week. Uh, for a while, we kind of thought our namesake Frank Slater had been in the civilian conservation Corps prior to the war. We have a photograph of him in full khaki uniform. But he wasn't an officer, so it's it's he's not in an enlisted guy in uniform. So we figured it was maybe the CCC. The what? Can, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Oh. During the Great Depression, it was one of the, the programs they put together. Basically, the people go around the country and do conservation things, uh, plant trees, things like that. Um, but the National Archives has uh, all the CCC records, and you can place a, a request in and see if there's a record. So I put a record request in a few months back and for Frank Slater, and they just emailed me last week and said, yeah, we got a file. Nice. They sent us an 11-page file, and turns out he had joined the CCC. Um okay. Went in you know, Alabama, he worked in Oregon, worked in California, became qualified in radio operation, and then uh, war broke out, mm-hmm. and he went off to war. Mm. That but, is a um, great find. So it's nice. We got to send that to the family. You know, Most of the family didn't know that. We didn't know that. Um, so he's still learning oh. stuff. Yeah. yeah well, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Why was the Slater named after Frank Slater? You so, know, he joined the Navy in February of 42. Yeah. He was a seaman second class. He was assigned to a 20 millimeter on in San Francisco heavy cruiser. Mm. And he shot down a Japanese torpedo bomber and probably killed the pilot. But the plane was already so close that it crashed right into his station and killed 11 people. No one yeah. tried abandoning their station. They kept firing right to the end. Silver Star. Uh, they named a ship after him. Okay. Okay. I Yeah, I didn't know that. All right. Um, anything okay so you uh you had that big news anything else uh coming up that you want people to be aware of uh if anyone wants to volunteer uh for a work week that's coming up in october first week of october uh you can live on the ship for a couple days entire week and uh we'll give you a project give you a paintbrush and where where uh is that uss slater.org uh yeah you can contact us through facebook messenger um can contact our director tim his email is just tim at usslater.org he handles all that got it um so john f curator at the uss slater in albany new york of course we just mentioned their website usslater.org definitely check it out um but also uh, oh what frank frank and chat he came for a spring work week frank you coming for the fall <laughs> oh, oh that frank was okay yeah frank <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, see if he shows up in the fall. Um, but in the meantime, uh, the Slater's YouTube channel, definitely uh, get on YouTube, search bar, type in USS Slater. It'll come right up. Check out their YouTube content. I always find it interesting. The um, Same with the uh, Buffalo Naval Park. And yeah, so uh, that was John up USS Slater. And now we're going to go on to Connor, Connor Kilgore at the... Alexander Henry Icebreaker Museum, Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, what do you guys got going going on? You know, you can you never one hundred percent get it right. Should I make my own introduction? <laughs> well, no. what's going on? Let's let's lay into Ken. Ken, come on. We've had Connor on for a, you know three or four times now, and you can't get it right. Well, what 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 did I get wrong? Is it not in Thunder Bay? Yes, it is. But just the the way you say it, it's like uh, uh, the Alexander Henry Icebreaker Museum. <laughs> Anyway, never mind. Uh, it's the Transportation <laughs> Museum Thunder Bay. Uh, that's that's what it's called. Oh, oh, you talk about the actual name. Yeah. Yeah, the museum. 
www.tmtb.ca. Yes. Um, Thunder Bay Transportation. No, yeah. Transportation, Transportation, Museum, Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay. Yeah. The Henry's are centerpiece. Um, so what's going on on the Henry? Uh, well, in the next oof, three days now, wow, it's coming up on us quick, uh, is Coast Guard Day. Uh, here at the Alexander Henry, we uh, celebrate once in July. It's generally in the weekend, either right before or right after the Henry's launch day, which was July 18th. So this this year, it's the year before, or the week a weekend before. We are celebrating uh, the Canadian Coast Guard. Uh, but also this year, we're also going to be celebrating the Royal Canadian Navy Reserve, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Uh, so we're going to be holding a joint uh, celebration for them. Uh, it'll be open to the public. Uh, John, what you said about being terrified of uh, free roam tours, I, I know that here <laughs> quite well because uh, we don't have the educational staff to uh, do guided tours for this event. So we're going to have to do that. So I'm actually mm -hmm. spending the next two days uh, safing the ship, for lack of a better word, uh, and prepping it for the event. Um, but it should be good. It should be really good. Uh, we are actually going to have another Coast Guard ship in attendance. Uh, the mm -hmm. CCGS Samuel Risley will be coming up. Uh, she is the ship that immediately replaced the Henry in the fleet. Uh, I'm sure you can find a picture of her. Um, but yeah, she, uh, so she'll be coming up for the event and she will also be, uh, doing an open house as well. So people who come up will be able to see what a 1950s era Coast Guard icebreaker was like and what a 1980s through to modern, uh, Coast Guard icebreaker is like. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, it's not a common event uh here in canada to have a celebration for the coast guard but we're excited to do it uh the official coast guard celebration i believe is in november to give you an idea so you can't really do much with canadian winters in november so uh that's one of the that's one of the reasons why we want to do this in the first place so this will be our second year and we're looking forward to it uh aside from that uh our other event of the season is uh our haunted harbor uh the henry does become a ghost ship in october and oh, no uh that sounds cool. yep like the windows go red and uh mm -hmm. that one center window there that goes green so it gets all spooky uh they're going to be holding that event this will be our second uh year we'll be partnering with the nonprofit uh, our kids count for that and uh, we're looking forward to holding this event this year. And it's going to be different compared to last year. So people who potentially want to come back, it's not uh, the same event from last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, really, the only other big thing going on is the fact that we're open. Uh, we're at the height of summer now, and we're seeing that. We're, we're seeing a considerable uptake compared to when we opened in May. Uh, Went from about three tours a day to now we're shooting through the roof where all our tour guys are probably doing four or more. And uh, it's going quite well. And what's really nice for us to see now is uh, the Americans are back. Uh, <laughs> is that a good thing? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it is. Uh, I'd say they make up about half of our visitors right now. So, And just this week, just in this last seven day period i've had florida i've had texas i've had california i've had connecticut lots of uh wisconsin minnesota and iowa which are like the three closest states to us uh i've had a couple of new yorkers uh let's see have i had any i haven't had anyone from maine yet yeah pretty much all the big states are have shown up now and mm -hmm. uh it's nice to see. It's really nice to see. Actually, we did get a person from Buffalo, New York. Uh, nice. so that was pretty cool. Uh, nice. And they knew uh, they knew about the Buffalo Naval Park and all that. And we also had a guy who actually, <laughs> no word of a lie, had just been on the dry dock tour of the Texas. Oh wow! And then oh, it come cool. to Thunder Bay for work reasons, and now he was on our tour. So, so did he know about us prior? Did he? Did he come to your site because the guy from who was on the, oh, Texas, the guy from Buffalo. To your site or yes, the guy from he, Buffalo? He had been to your museum before. 
And when he saw there was a museum ship in Thunder Bay, he went, oh, I'm going to take my opportunity. I'm going to go down and see it. So that was good. Well, that's cool. Yeah, it um, is. But that's more or less how it is. Well, like, what's the okay. best way of getting to Thunder Bay? Is it just driving? Or? Uh, well, flying or driving, uh, realistically, there's no water tramp transport here. Uh, not anymore. Um, yeah, don't get me started. I could go on a whole essay about how there used to be passenger ships that come. They used to come. Yeah. Uh, no, I know. Uh, but yeah, driving is generally how most of them get here. Um, because Canada, uh, if you look at Canada's roadway system, it kind of all kind of converges on us uh, at one point. So basically, if you're traveling across Canada, you you end up coming through our town. Uh, so that is one advantage we have is we get people from all over the U.S. We get all people from all over Canada. And uh, we're actually seeing a lot of people from overseas. We've had Germans, although that might be more due to the cruise ships. We've had um, Belgians. We had some Scots relatively recently. Get in the Jetta and ride. <laughs> that was for me. Shane, Shane's got a Jetta. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, but no, it, like we're seeing it's seeing good, and I'm hoping that you guys are getting similar number, like it's similar increase now that you're in the height of the season. Because I, I one thing I absolutely love is when you're doing this and you're introducing the history of this region. Because again, my ship might be about the ship, but there's a whole section, like how about half of the upper deck is about other parts of our history mm. because we don't have a building yet is you get to teach people about the richness of this, of our region uh, and just the fascinating things that have gone on here and how uh, we get to educate people. And that's something, that's one of the reasons why I even do this. Like I absolutely love it. Uh, but other than that, let's see. More or less, that's about it. Um, there's a couple displays we're going to be working on soon. Uh, a couple new displays. Uh, and it should be exciting uh, to see what happens in the following year. Because, oh, last thing. Uh, <laughs> we are actually in the process of acquiring the paint to finish up the red on the ship. Mm. Yeah, you uh, talked about that prior. Yeah, we, I talked about last week. We're, we're at that point now. Um, we're going to start at the stern, which wasn't painted when we got the ship. We're going to go around the port side and then come back around the bow. And that's that's our plan for this year. Make sure you take uh, videos of that. I'm sure that's oh, going to be an adventure. It's going to be a log, 100%. <laughs> well, look at Gaming for Dummies. Coming What's that? USS Alabama staying the night. I wonder if he's staying the Gaming for Dummies, yeah. I wonder if they're oh. on the battleship, staying over on the battleship. Thanks for watching. Definitely, so. yeah. yeah. Glad that, is, that is one of my favorite. That is one of my favorite ships. Is the Alabama? I love it. The the other thing I want to mention about Connor Kilgore, of course, he's working behind the scenes, you know, handling comments, and he's with the Alexander Henry, the Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker. But he's also one of the administrators for the Museum Ships Facebook group. So if you have not checked out the Museum Ships Facebook group, there's, I don't know, 10, 20 posts a day on there at least, right, Connor? Yeah, at least. Uh, and and a lot of, in, you know, current event stuff with, uh, you know, Museum Ships as well as uh, a lot of history as well. So that's how I came across Connor. So definitely check out uh, Museum Ships, the Museum Ships Facebook group if you haven't had a chance already. And of course, as Connor was uh, spelling it out for you, the Alexander, make sure I get this right. The Alexander Henry Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker on display in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Yeah. How'd that, how'd that sound? That sounds better. To learn more, check out the website, www.tmtb.ca. Sound good? Yep. Or check out our Facebook page, the Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay on Facebook. <laughs> I will make a note of that for the future. Facebook, right. the Transportation Museum of Thunder Bay. Do a search for that on Facebook. But uh, before before we close things out, I always want I always tell people, you know, when it comes to the uh, Buffalo Naval Park, the USS Slater, um, and their YouTube channels, uh, maybe the uh, Alexander Henry will start doing a YouTube channel as well. One of the best ways and one of the simplest ways is to simply check out their content and subscribe. 
If you have enjoyed their videos, but you haven't clicked subscribe, it's one of the simplest yes, yet most effective ways to throw your support behind what these guys do. So um, check out their videos, hit the likes, all of that stuff. It goes to building their YouTube channel. And once they reach a certain point, actually both they're both both channels are over a thousand subscribers. So they're starting to earn money. And it's another way to generate revenue for those museum ships. So I always want to mention that. If you guys haven't done it already, hit subscribe, please. We are uh, going to have to talk to Tim and Parks from the USS Kid. Have you been watching that series of videos that they do where they splash water on everybody yeah. have, you been, have you been seeing that what's going on i, I want to get to the bottom i can't remember They've been doing that since they started really i've only seen it really recently i i actually haven't seen it at all how did i miss oh. this oh well, yeah I, they, yeah basically they like the the whoever's talking in that episode or in their video he gets splashed with water at least twice uh oh during the God, video splashing them all over the place they're throwing like newspapers at them so they're telling the story like oh yeah you know the ship was out in ocean and then it went to pick up and then all of a sudden they get a face full of water and they're dripping really? wet but then yeah. they just continue on with the story so uh, i know there's a series that it's called i can't remember what it's called uh shoot but yeah i want to find out what gave them that idea not that we would mimic it i guess but uh, <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that doesn't necessarily sound like your style but hey if it works for uh yeah Tim it, and parks people love it it seems so yeah really i i'll i'll have to search for it i have i haven't seen it um let's see uh john shane anything else you guys want to mention before we close it out Thanks All right. everyone for watching this. Yeah, I definitely want I to was, thank Oh, yeah, I do want to say something very quickly. Oh, we don't have to yeah, answer. Go it. For it. But I was very I was I was not expecting that answer from uh Captain about Duderman. yeah, thank you, Duderman. Thank you. I was not expecting his answer about that the upgrades that they did to the DC uh you know in Puget Sound, they were you, you, that they were not helpful because you know, reading through the damage control uh, report. Uh, it seems as though they actually. It sounded like that those things really helped. The the curtain, the the water curtains. They broke up the fire mains into eight sections as opposed to four to relieve the stress. Uh, when you have eight instead of four, you're taking away twice the pressure or something. Uh, you know, they had more uh, respirators on board, uh, but he just kind of said straight, nope nothing was helpful uh, and, and i don't i know it's just conversational and stuff but yeah well that interesting it was <sighs> as a you know, it's, it's, it's always a risk having somebody like that come on you never know what you're going to get right and you know i was nervous up to you know for it up up until right until we finally got him connected so you never know what he's going to say and then once they drop a bomb like that or you know a piece a little piece of information like that it just makes you well want to have another episode about it <laughs> that's that's uh -huh. the way i look at it quickly um, are we going to mention the lst yeah yeah i should have yeah. said that earlier should we Shane, are you aware of the uh, uh, the LST? Um... Three nine three. Thank you, three nine three. And I don't think so. The ship itself, or what its relation to, or well, okay, real, real quick, real just quick. real quick. Yeah, real quick. So, no, no, no. Uh, how do you three guys know about it? I've well, been on it. I'll I'll tell you what I'll yeah, I'll, I'll I'm going just on. gonna give I'm gonna give a brief overview and I'm gonna refer everybody to I unless Connor you say otherwise I'm gonna refer every uh, everyone over to the museum ships uh, Facebook group because Connor placed a post on there earlier today about the LST three nine three which is on display in Muskegon Michigan having an issue uh, apparently the city of Muskegon is threatening to pull funding that they had earmarked for the LST-393. Now, whenever news like this comes up about any museum ship, I kind of want to bring it to the forefront so that people can learn about it, do their own investigation, see how they can support those guys. But there seems to be a little bit of a mixed message mm -hmm. you know, coming out from both sides. Connor, you want to say anything about it? Yeah, basically, uh, from what I've been able to read in the LST's uh, public posts, um, 
it sound it kind of sounded like they were saying that the city was starting to put away the money because the plan was, and to my knowledge, the LST has not been dry docked since the '40s, uh, and she has she has considerable problems uh, with her hull. And it sounded like the plan had been to put it up on land, uh, but it's the story they're saying is the city is uh, threatening to pull the funding. The city is saying another story because you sent them an email, Ken, and mm -hmm. they said something else. Yeah, I, I emailed uh, the uh, council members. I emailed the mayor. It, so, uh, it sounds like Lego History Sam did the same thing. He may have received the same response as I did, but the city has a totally different response to what mm -hmm. the so representatives of the 393 are saying. So I, I guess the whole point of bringing this up is people should be aware of it. You know, we don't want these ships to disappear. And, no. and, and so, and obviously we don't any, want anything to happen to any museum ship like what happened to the Sullivan's uh, a little over a year ago in April. Uh, so, you know, I, I definitely want people to support them, but what the whole story is, I think it might be too soon to tell. But yeah. Yeah. So I would say if you want to learn more about it, you know, check out the Museum Ship Facebook group, um, Google the LST 393 and see what news stories come up. Uh, just be aware of it. And yeah. that's why Connor and I are bringing it up tonight. We yeah, don't, and, and, you know, oh, go ahead, Shane. Yeah, sorry. And it's so important to go to the source. Yeah. One of the things that we learned from the sinking was that, you know, the sidewalk superintendents, the armchair admirals, <laughs> everyone was spreading what their thoughts were. Yeah. And we tried to stay on top. And we appreciate that people came to us directly so that they can get the story and what we're doing. But yeah, please try to go to the source as much as possible, uh, as opposed to conjecture from sidewalk mm -hmm. superintendents. Yeah, I agree. And just last thing of myself, because as far as I'm aware, I'm the only one of us four who's actually been to the LST 393. I uh, have not been there, no. Okay. I got a chance to go to it. Uh, I got a chance to go to it last year. I really, ultimately though, regardless of what happens here, I really hope that the history is preserved because when I was there, the entire tank deck was turned into a museum space. Like it's, it's beautiful in there. And I just really hope that whatever happens, the ship ends up in a good home, in a good place, and preferably potentially out of the water because that was what their plan was. Because uh, stuff like that is just so hard to replace. Like with submarines in the U.S., there's how many, 13 of them in the U.S. at least or more. I, I'm not sure exactly sure how many. But – LSTs, I think there's only two in yeah. the U.S., and I think only one's running. Like, they are such a rare thing. And it's to me, it's like to lose that potentially would be devastating to this community. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah definitely. So yeah, key, uh, look up the LST 393. Like Shane says, go to the source, try and uh, learn as much as you can and support them any way that you can. And, um, yeah, I think that's about as much as we can say about that right yeah. now. Probably more to come for sure. Yeah. Um, we'll keep it all posted. Yeah. So if there is anything else, I'll just say for everybody that, uh, tuned in, uh, to us tonight, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to author PT Duderman talk about his book trial by fire. If you want to check out his book, I believe the link is available in the description of this video below. Um, so definitely want to say thanks to PT Duderman for joining us and as you know, not to repeat myself, but I will anyway, thank you for joining us. You guys are the reason we do this without you guys watching. It's not possible for us to put this together. So we definitely appreciate you tuning in tonight and for audio versions of this podcast, search for museum ship mafia on your favorite podcast platform. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel history X. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Good night, guys. everybody.